Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Friday, October 11th, 2024, and we are continuing our best farm advice ever week. Today, I'm going to share some of your advice that came in through the comments and messages this week and share some of the, my thoughts on those because there is some good and insightful advice in there. You all are amazing. Also, I'm going to share some thoughts on where to put your gardens thoughts on tunnel garlic, and give you a Friday field note for your weekend. So let's do it. When we return on Monday, I will have officially turned 30-12, and I will have coached some soccer and probably will have also watched some soccer. The U.S. men's national team plays this weekend with their new coach for the first time, as does Racing Louisville, the official women's professional soccer team of no-till market gardeners. But I am perhaps most excited about eating sweet potatoes. Uh, they are out of the ground. They are fully cured, which takes about two weeks, and it just may as well be a holiday. We'll call it my birthday. I'm seeing lots of shots of northern lights this morning from our northern farmer friends after yesterday's geomagnetic storm. That is one of those events that makes me deeply appreciate what a wondrous place this planet is. The profound number of elements that had to come together in the universe at the exact right times and right levels to generate a planet capable of creating and then sustaining life is always an extraordinary, precious reality to me. Hopefully this show helps inspire us to all take better care of this abundant rock we share so that many, many, many more generations of humans can enjoy these light shows and make everyone in the South super jealous with their posts about them because like our light show was not nearly as cool, which I think is probably the point of it all anyway. Touche universe. Anyway, let's dive into some of the advice you all shared this week on the final day of best farm advice ever week. One such piece of advice came from uh, Patreon member Free Town Food Forest, who said it was a common piece of advice they'd hear um, to ask yourself why. Why are you doing a specific thing, but added the importance of asking how as well. They write, I found it helps me to cut back on superfluous chores and conversely not skip over tasks that might seem negligible, but would set me up for success later. I've used it to decide if I need to and can physically enter a new market and when it was time to exit a sales outlet that wasn't profitable. It reminds me that downtime spent doing something off the farm is essential to being able to come back to the farm feeling refreshed. With big and little decisions thoughtfully considered, with why and how, I can distill my intentions and more clearly see my ability and the reality of the farm and myself, end quote. Obviously, after yesterday's ep episode, you know I have affection for asking questions, but I also really like the idea of asking how. In English, how is such a dynamic, evocative word. Being able to capture emotions with questions like, how can this be? Or, how could you let this happen? I don't know if I can do that in much more of an actor voice, but like, how could you let this happen? Oh, that was terrible. I should never do that again. Plots of movies and novels basically exist because of the word how. How is also a humble word. Someone asks you to do something and responding how takes a, at least a small amount of humility. It requires you to admit you don't know, revealing your ignorance of something to someone and allowing them to teach you. And in that way, I like the idea of coupling it with why for farming. It's a bit of uh, humility. Why did my potatoes get so much rot in storage? Well, let's walk through the steps. How did I grow them? How did I harvest them? How did I cure them? How did I store them? In lean manufacturing, there is the philosophy of asking why five times, perhaps throwing a few hows in there wouldn't hurt. How true. Hey, uh, so for like the next 30 seconds, the audio sound is gonna sound a little weird because I had to use my room mic because for whatever reason, my mic had gone out and I didn't know it, but the uh, must have been some fun interference from the universe, probably from the sun, goofy thing. And anyway, uh, so you, it, if you ever hear like it sound like I'm in a big room, it's because I'm in a big room and I have my room mic that just, just, you know, my just in case mic. Anyway, enjoy the next 30 seconds. It's kind of ironic. Another comment I thought was interesting comes in from st at Stephanie Somer on YouTube. They write a nice comment about how we often share failures on this channel. And Stephanie notes, Quote, a true failure is one that doesn't seek to improve. This comment evokes a lot of things for me. One, I think about how a challenge of social media is the feeling, is the feeling, though I hope it's changing, but the feeling that you need to come off as an expert to talk about something. 
This is difficult because most of the actual experts are older folks who don't typically use social media as much or not in the same way at least. And there is a market for how to grow X. So younger farmers like myself in their 30 teens get on and try to be helpful. But our experience is limited. One thing that I have done to try to mitigate my own deficiencies is to simply host podcasts where I talk to other farmers. I go to farm conferences and sit in on many different types of presentations. I read a lot of ag research papers and farm books as well. And I kind of proudly employ our comment section. Sure, comment sections uh, have a reputation for a reason. They can be run amok with nonsense a lot of times and needlessly hateful, but it doesn't have to be that way. I think oftentimes it winds up in a negative space because with a lot of other channels, commenters are not encouraged to contribute like they are here. Our viewers are smart folks and I value our commenters and tell them as much. I have noticed a big difference in the comments on our videos get just based on that mutual respect, plus the fact that we don't present ourselves as the be all end all of farming insight. As I always say, I do not have a monopoly on all the good ideas or good advice. What did I get wrong? Or what did I say that was incomplete or misrepresented? I'm okay with being wrong. I expect it to happen and agree this is just good general life advice. Be humble and open to failure and open to making mistakes. As I tell the kids who I coach, you have to be really bad at something for a long time in order to get good at it. And I also tell them a loss is only a loss if you don't learn from it. So that crop that failed this year, it's only a failure if you don't learn from it, as Stephanie said. What could you have done better? Or perhaps more appropriately for today's episode, how could you have done it better? Okay, we'll do one more. This one from our friend Paul at Mountain Roots Farm in Tennessee on Instagram, who we did a couple videos with this spring. You should check out. I'll link those in the show notes. Anyway, Paul's advice from, uh, that he sent in on Instagram was simply two words. Start small. And I think that is great advice for new farmers. People will write me after they've bought like 10 or 30 acres and see if I could come consult with them. And well, first, I don't do consults. I don't have the time, to be honest with you. But uh, consultations also sort of feel like paywalls to me. So in that way, this show is my consultation. But second, if you are going to get a consultation, talk to the consultant before you buy the property. You may find out that you need a tenth of the acreage that you just bought or less or that it is not suitable for what you want to do there. In terms of starting small, it is better and less expensive to grow out than to shrink down. It is also easier physically and mentally to handle that. And like we talked about yesterday with the confining your days to a certain time, confining your farm to a smaller plot of land will help you to maximize that property better. And I would add to Paul's advice here and say that it's not just for beginning farmers, start small, but also maybe get smaller as you go. That doesn't necessarily mean shrink your land and it doesn't necessarily mean a 10 acre farm needs to be a three acre farm, but tighten the operation as much as you can before expanding out anymore. Livestock is obviously different, grain is different, but every operation should be maximized before expanding it. Maybe you can add different enterprises within the same land base instead of taking the same enterprise and spreading it out. Planting more stuff doesn't necessarily mean making more money or growing more food unless you have dialed in what you already do and made sure it's profitable and possible. To be sure, there was far more good farming advice than I can reasonably share that came in from you all this week. And I do fear that if I shared too much advice at once, it could all become muddled. The value of advice is that it comes at exactly the right time in the right way. Like salt, it needs to be sprinkled on lightly and not poured on. Uh, luckily, no dummy you know would dedicate an entire week to sharing farming advice. That, that would be a terrible idea. Next up, we'll get a question from one of our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no-till growers, BRB. Today's episode is brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process, so make sure to check them out. If you, the listener, want to support our work, you can do so at patreon.com slash no-till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere if that questions come in, but I will always get to those Patreon questions. You can join for as low as $2 a month, and I'll give you a shout out at the end of the show just for signing up or for bumping up from one level to another. 
Two dollars a month is like twenty four dollars a year, which you can't even buy a new T shirt for that amount. But you can support a near endless supply of ecological farming info. Deal of the century. I believe Dipen Palmer said that. Anyway, today's question comes from Patreon member Goalie Tracked Food Forest Farmstead, who writes. Would love to hear experienced market gardeners advice on how to choose where to start your beds slash fields and what you're going to grow where based on the property overall. Cases where the property is more than needed to market garden and why to set up the farm in a particular spot. Thanks. Okay, great questions. Uh, I'm going to try to at least cover some of it. One thing I see a lot just around the countryside is that people put their gardens weirdly far away from their houses. Out of sight, out of mind is not a good thing in gardening. Actually, I, I don't think that's a good thing in, any, in reference to anything, but further away your garden is from your home or where you are most often, like potentially your job, the less likely you are to tend to it. Everyone's personality is different, of course, but if you want to succeed, you need to commit to taking care of the gardens, and the best way to do that is to keep them as close as you possibly can to where you are most often. Next, if you can avoid a floodplain, avoid a floodplain. Not everyone gets a choice, obviously, on their property, but nothing will undo your, all of your hard work faster than even a small flood. Avoid slopes as much as you can. They make everything more difficult. If you have a slope and can afford a terrace or afford to terrace it, make large terraces with some machinery of some sort. Terraces large enough to put several beds on. In other words, not just a single terrace for a single bed. Check out the video we did with Sage Hill Ranch Gardens on this subject. Again, I'll link those in the show notes. The more sun, the better, but preferably with some large trees to the southwest. Well, the southwest here, at least in Kentucky, to block wind, but not block too much sun. To your part about where to plant what, if you do have a shadier area, that's a good spot for things like summer greens. Uh, and if you're in a really hot area, that could be a good place for most of the garden just to have uh, shade in the summer from deciduous trees. You don't want to put your gardens in a place where getting a water source there will be pricey. So that's something to think about. What about road access? That is a huge underrated part of picking a place. You will want to haul materials in and out easily. If a large truck can't get back there to dump wood chips or compost or straw or whatever, and you can't get back there to haul out your garlic or your potatoes and etc., and you're going to find yourself having to do that by hand, that's that's no good. That's going to be exhausting and cost you a lot of time. Also, what about deer fencing and deer pressure? Hide your gardens in the woods out of sight, and the deer will be super pleased about that decision. Often, keeping it closer to home will at least reduce your pest pressure a little bit, your giant pest pressure, like giant rodents, deer, giant rodents. Generally, soil quality doesn't intimidate me to the point that I would put my gardens in an iffy place that has better soil, like a floodplain where good soil most often resides because of, you know, deposited silt. Most soils can be improved, uh, though, as I've said, compacted clay is definitely the most challenging. Like if you have a choice to get away from that and it's not going to compromise other elements of your garden space, I would probably go away from the compacted clay. Drainage is another thing I've learned uh, in all my Let's call them let's call them opportunities all of my opportunities to move farms i've definitely learned to appreciate how important good drainage is do a percolation test uh, before placing your garden somewhere because you may have to rethink how you lay the gardens out or where you put them or if you need to install drainage more on starting gardens soon probably many times over in the course of the show but the fact that you are asking these questions is a good start oftentimes people just pick the flattest, sunniest spot and go with that. But that's not always the best approach. And there's a lot that could be said about when to raise beds and when not to. I promise to get into that stuff soon. Thank you, Goalie Tracked Food Forest Far Farmstead, for the questions and the support. For new and existing Patreon members, there is a post there at patreon.com slash growers called the October Show Thread, I think. Uh, post your comments and questions there for me to tackle here on the show. Up next... Some thoughts on growing garlic in high tunnels. Be right back. Hey, you all. The No-Till Growers crew and I want to use the ad space today to point you towards a couple resources to help farmers in North Carolina directly affected by Hurricane Helene. Both the Organic Grower School, or OGS, and the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, called CFSA, 
our local ag organizations there who have done a lot of work gathering resources for those of us who want to chip in. So their resources will be linked in the show notes as well as the Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project or ASAP, which was the organization mentioned by Lyric last Tuesday when I spoke with her about her farm's experience with the hurricane. It is impossible to overstate how big of a disaster this is. Sincerely, Helene is one of the worst American disasters since Katrina, so please help if you can, even if just throwing a few bucks towards a farmer's GoFundMe would be huge. Thanks, and back to the show. Okay, so the last three years, I have grown garlic in our high tunnel all the way to full size with the intention not of curing and selling this garlic as large bulb garlic, but rather the goal has been to simply have fresh garlic, that is the uncured garlic where the bulbs have differentiated, but the paper hasn't fully formed yet and it's still very juicy and frankly mind-blowing. I've wanted to have that version of garlic at a that specific stage much earlier. And so I started planting garlic in the high tunnels around now. And here's what I learned. One, in order for most hard neck garlic to form a proper bulb, it needs, and this is a rough estimate, but is generally accepted time period, it needs 40 days under 40 degrees before the spring to achieve that. Though it is more interesting and complicated than that, which maybe we'll get into since it is garlic planting time here in the Northern Hemi, but we'll save that for another show. In the field, achieving this natural vernalization and necessary cold period, is no problem, but in a tunnel with the warmer soils, it seems that one out of the three years we've done this, that about a fifth of the garlic did not properly bulb up, which is not an insignificant amount considering how valuable that space is. However, in the tunnel, every stage of the garlic happens two weeks earlier. Green garlic is available earlier, garlic scapes happen earlier, uh, and fresh garlic is ready to sell two weeks earlier. Notably, I do discuss garlic in the Living Soil Handbook in great detail, which when you pick it up from notillgrows.com, that helps to support our work. At the farmer's market, we were up until this past season when we stopped doing the farmer's market, but we were two weeks earlier to market with all those different forms of garlic, thanks to growing it in the tunnel. Now, the way we sell our fresh garlic is at $3 a bulb or 2 or $5. So that means we can successfully harvest roughly 700 bulbs in a 95-foot-long tunnel bed or 28.6 meters, which, and forgive these numbers, I'll try and make it make sense, but which is five rows of garlic at eight inches apart in the row or 20 centimeters apart in the row. So anyway, with that spacing, we get about 700 bulbs and probably a little bit of loss, give or take. But that 95 foot bed could be worth somewhere between $1,700 and $2,100 plus whatever we get for the scapes. So that's not a bad return and the crop is out in a relatively early time by early to mid-June and that gives us plenty of time for a second round of cucumbers or summer greens or whatever but is it worth it well I like passive crops like garlic where I plant it in the fall and don't really have to fiddle with it until I start harvesting in the spring but the garlic will take space from other crops like early tomatoes or cucumbers peppers etc plus late crops like lettuce arugula and so on if I'm a home gardener I'm probably not wasting that tunnel space If I'm a gardener for chefs and don't have a ton of competition from other growers, same thing. But if I'm a market farmer, it's at least worth dabbling in early alliums. Not to sound redundant today, I feel like I've said this a few times, but we did a whole video on overwintered alliums with Evan Chender this spring, who was the culinary gardener and whose farm and market of restaurants in the area got hammered in Hurricane Helene. So I will post the link to that video, but also the link to how to kick in a few bucks to support Evan and his pack of Dotsons, which are very cute, in the show notes. Otherwise, I think that's it for the day. Uh, Like last Friday, I will leave you with a Friday field note after the Patreon reads, because like every day, I will also give a shout out to our new Patreon members. I kind of think there have been new signups every day since I started this show, and I would love to keep that going for as long as possible and get a new few, few new names to completely butcher on Monday over there at patreon.com slash no till growers. Give a like on this video if you found it helpful, but more than anything, share it. Share it in a group you like. Maybe like, let's say this week, a banjo group. Banjo people love daily farming podcasts. It's like a known thing. Make sure you are subscribed or following wherever you are hearing this. Shout out to Willie Breeding for the theme music and the team at No-Till Growers for all of their support. Oh, shouts to Patreon member Bill Marshall, who uh, sent me these, you can see them if you're watching on uh, YouTube, but uh, books on amateur radio emergency services, which is very cool. I do plan to explore that idea a bit more soon for all of you because I love the idea of farmers not just being prepared for themselves, but being prepared 
for their communities. Um, so having somebody they can rely on for support. If you are indeed enjoying the show and want to see it keep going and growing, please consider that signing up to be a Patreon member like Bill, who is awesome. Otherwise, I will see you all back here on on Monday. And we'll close out with uh, some Patreon shoutouts, followed by a Friday field note for you. So big shoutouts today to... Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry, you all. Big shoutouts today to Divya Stroibing. Definitely got that one right. Tom Batty. Or Beatty. Could be either. Could be both. Sonia Esquita. Esqueda. Got that one. And B. Delia. B. Delia. I think I think I'm just four for four today. Solid, solid performance. Thank you all for watching or listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Okay, so I have this uh, thing as a coach where I, I really, really try and get our kids to focus on their body language and what it tells their teammates and what it tells the opponent and just what it does to them you know, to their play, to their, to their game. And one of the things that I think about is, you know, like if you, for instance, uh, you know, if you have a, a, a kid who kind of, uh, every time they mess up, they kind of put their head down and they kind of like sort of dramatically, you know, show that they're disappointed in themselves or they're disappointed in something that happened or they say something negative or they're getting angry and they're kind of like throwing their weight around, throwing their fists around or whatever. Um, and just kind of being, uh, you know, overall visibly angry and um and anyway like i'm always trying to encourage them like body language body language like be positive clap for your teammates those sorts of things right but in farming we don't really have that so the other day i was kind of like really frustrated with some of the things that were going on in our farm and um just like you know just the lettuce wasn't growing like it was supposed to and it just little things and i was really frustrated and i kind of came into the to the uh, wash pack shed and Hannah, <laughs> Hannah was like, Jesse, body language. You know, it was just a moment of being like, you know, keep your head up, uh, keep going, those sorts of things. But also like, it made me realize that, you know, we don't, as business owners, uh, we don't really have a coach. Like we don't really have fans. We don't really have people cheering us on and, and giving us that, that moment of being like, Hey, look at how you're holding yourself. Like that's affecting your crew or that's affecting you or that's affecting me. Um, and we don't really have that as, as, uh, you know, as farmers and as business owners. And, and it does have a huge profound effect on, on how a team performs or how an individual performs, like how they're holding themselves. And, and I just realized like there's a lot of times since she said that, or since she pointed that out that I do, I kind of like, I wear it really hard when things aren't going well. And, um, and so I think, uh, ultimately that, um, you know, we need to be, to, to hire coaches on farms. I think that's what I'm saying. Yep. All right. Enjoy your weekend.